Well, welcome everyone uh, to our next installment of our uh, energy storage at PNNL webinar series. I'm Vince Sprinkle. I'm the senior advisor for uh, energy storage here at PNNL, and uh, happy to have you back uh, if you've been at, attending these uh, webinars every two weeks. So uh, today we've got a, a interesting topic that's at the core of what we're trying to do with the new grid storage launch pad. And so David Reed will be joining us to talk about the reliability test laboratory uh, that we're currently working on and how that's going to really play as we look at uh, expanding the grid storage launch pad and what we're trying to do with these new technologies. You know, understanding how these storage systems are going to, offer, you know, are they going to perform as predicted under the grid duty cycles is a critical aspect for uh, tech, especially new technologies as they get out and making sure we can validate that. And so now we are able to do that at a uh, smaller scale when the grid storage launch pad is operational uh, here in, uh, in towards the end of 2023, we'll be able to do much larger scale systems. But at the core, uh, we're going to be doing that fundamental work of you know, trying to understand what the performance of these systems are, um, you know, what's the degradation, and then are there root causes we can, you know, get into to improve the performance of those systems. So I'm looking forward to uh, uh, David's talk uh, today. Let me do a quick introduction and we'll turn it over to David. So David Reed is the Chief Material Scientist and Program Manager in the Battery Materials and Systems Group uh, at PNNL. Before joining the lab in 2010, he worked in industry at 3M in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Praxair in Tonawanda, New York. While in industry, David worked in high temperature electrochemistry, material synthesis and processing, alternative material manufacturing methods, dielectric materials, coatings, failure analysis, new materials development, design of experiments, and rapid commercialization processing. At PNNL's primary focus has been in developing and testing new materials and components for electrochemical devices. He is currently program manager for the DOE Office of Electricity sponsored uh, program at PNNL um, and is project manager for several industrially sponsored programs. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome David uh, uh, for the presentation and a few notes. So we, the, in general, the re, there are recordings of the slides uh, of this presentation that will be posted on the website. There will be links that show up, but we encourage you as uh, to add your questions to the chat as we're going through, and then we will have time at the end uh, to moderate and to get, get back with you on those questions. So with that, David, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Um, let me, I'm gonna share my slides here. Does everyone see that? Okay. Okay. Thanks. You can see it. Everyone fine. Okay. Thanks, Vince, for the uh, for the opportunity. Um, just to give a little discussion today about um, the reliability lab at PNNL that we use for uh, testing batteries for uh, for grid applications. So, kind of um, how I had outlined for today is um, just to go over. Uh, spend some time on the um, the goals of the, the battery reliability laboratory, um, some of the capabilities. So um, just a high level view on some of the capabilities, we have approximately um, the ability to test about four to 500 single lithium ion cells and about at, the, at this point right now, about 30 um, modules. And when I talk about a module, I'll, I'll talk about in size, in terms of power and energy, about 10 kilowatt or 40 kilowatt hours. So, but I'll go over this in a little, that in a little bit more detail. Um, some, of the, some of the first things I'll talk about in the capabilities is the, the single lithium ion battery uh, testing. And um, I'll show some of the infrastructure that we put in in the last couple of years, uh, some of the goals, some of the uh, analysis and the testing we've had and, and some brief examples. Um, the next, the next uh, area that I'll uh, I'll talk about is the module testing I just discussed. You know, they're obviously a little bit uh, they're they're bigger than the single cells. Uh, go over some of the infrastructure, and then um, I'll, I'll use 
some results. Obviously, I can't go over all of them, but I, I've chosen about three three different modules to kind of go over and just describes in in, in a little bit more detail of uh, some of the tests that uh, that we've done, some of the different grid duty cycles that we run on those. And then the third section is something relatively uh, it's 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 relatively new. It's uh, second life testing, so we're we're using. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to re-rate used batteries from um, from buses, and uh, I'll get into a little bit more detail on that too. And then the last thing, what uh, what I'll talk about is some of the on-site characterization and um, how we are, uh, correlate that performance and degradation. So obviously, one of the things we're really interested in is is what the degradation uh, is. What is the form? Why is it degrading over time? Some of these batteries, and we have a lot of really nice on-site characterization techniques here. That, and and I'll show a couple examples of how we've been able to do that and understand what that degradation is. So to go on to the next um, the next slide, um, just a, a high level view again. Really, the aim of the lab is to test and understand the behavior of a lot of different various of, of various battery technologies at or near realistic you know, grid, uh, uh, grid conditions. And we do this by, there's a lot of standardized tests developed by DOE Office of Electricity uh, protocols. And, and I'll be talking about those a little bit later. Uh, some of the purposes, so again, this is uh, kind of a high level slide, but the purpose is to accelerate the development of grid energy storage technologies. So we're looking at not just existing technologies, but also some of the emerging technologies. Uh, to validate the performance of these uh, of these battery systems under standard testing protocols, as I described before, and then collaboration. We do a lot of collaboration with battery designers, um, uh, utilities, and manufacturers, and we often we give them a lot of feedback, obviously on on you know the lifetime and the performance when when we're when we're testing these. So some of the outcomes we'd like to see on this is. Um, obviously to provide uh, some operation guidelines and to be an independent validation. So like a third party uh, to tell people, you know, obviously with the performance, uh, again, to understand the degradation mechanism. We just don't want to test these for, you know, two, three years under different duty cycles. We'd also like to know why, if, if, if they are, if they're degrading, if they're seeing capacity loss, why is that? And then the last one here I have is develop a test platforms and protocols and use it as a foundation for the new grid storage launch pad. So for those that don't um, know, uh, there's gonna be a new new building dedicated um, to, to grid storage and that's gonna be uh, uh, coming online at PNNL in the fall of 2023. So to get into just a kind of um, uh, a kind of a view of some of the different uh, batteries, um, I'll say most of these are, are modules, so they're a little bit larger, you know, higher higher power and energy. Uh, some of the things that were being tested on uh, on site now, obviously lithium ion and some uh, we, uh, numerous lithium ions, also a couple of vanadium uh, redox flow batteries, um, some lead acid, sodium metal halides, iron nickel. And then I have asterisks here, sodium ion, nickel, zinc, and zinc base. So there's uh, there's also additional ones that are either in, in the process of being procured or being shipped or um, being just um, uh, commercialized or they're near commercialization. So those 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 are planned for the future. So so in this um, uh, graph here, what I'm what I'm kind of showing is is a couple of uh, vanadium flow batteries. One on the left hand side, uh, left upper. That's uh, that's it's made by Strident Energy. That's a um, and it has it inside of it is the electrolyte. That's, that's something that was developed at PNNL. That's uh, it's a bi-additive electrolyte. So it's a vanadium base, but it has a little bit of magnesium chloride and, and uh, ammonium phosphate. And that what that does is help with the temperature stability. Um, the other the uh, the other vanadium flow batteries here is by UET. It's a mixed acid electrolyte. So it's not only uh, sulfuric acid, but it's also hydrochloric acid. And some of the other batteries you see here is obviously there's some lithium ion single cells in the bottom uh, bottom left. There's lithium ion modules, sodium metal halide module, and also um, lead acid modules. The next slide just kind of shows a little bit more of um, you know we do we do uh, lead acids um, also flooded and also um, uh, valve regulated. Also, I've been looking at some iron nickel, and then. Um, there's also a lithium ion module here is from core power. And why this is important to us is we're, we're actually putting in a, two large batteries on site, much obviously much larger than, than this, this module, but this one can be used as a as kind of a test site for those other two that are on, on our campus. 
And then on the right there is a lot shows a lot of different um, manu uh, in, in people in industry and manufacturer battery manufacturers that we're working with. There's that list is always growing, and obviously we work very closely with some of our industrial sponsors. Um, give them a lot of feedback. They're they're often very interested in uh, some of the results that we're seeing. So to get into you know this section to get into the single uh, lithium ion battery testing. So I've I've limited this to just uh, single lithium ion. We we also do a lot of other uh, single single cell testing, but this, these are commercial cells. So I'm limiting it to, to commercial cells at at this point. So what you what you see is this um, a lot of infrastructure. Again, we've put in a lot of channel. Um, um, uh, cyclers with has has a lot of channels. Uh, I've, I think we have up over 400 plus single um, single cells being tested at any one point. Uh, there obviously there's the cylindrical cells. Uh, we also have quite a few environmental chambers, so we can run things at controlled atmospheres, um, also at temperatures. We, we've pretty much uh, to this point have done everything at ambient temperatures, but in the future we'll be we'll be doing um, a little bit higher temperatures also. Some of the variables we look at. Um, I think they're pretty obvious, like time, state of charge, depth of discharge, the power, and, and again, it's the temperature. So to, just to get in and, and, and talk about a little bit of what the goals of what we're trying to do uh, when we test these single lithium ion cells, um, we, we, we have a lot of, on the left, we have a lot of different chemistries that are available, um, LFP, NMC, NCAs. So we get these from a lot of different suppliers. And we're trying to take that chemistry <clears throat> and understand as we tested under different grid duty cycles, as an example is on the right there, for example, just baseline, that's that's kind of an aging protocol, whereas, and then there's frequency regulation and then the peak shaving. So these are these performance protocols that I talked about. So we test these cells under these different duty cycles and we use it to predict the lifetime. And some other things that we look at, and then to do that, to predict that is we can use as you see on the on the right there on the left is electrical electrical data so dvdq and out type analysis where we can isolate anodes and, and cathodes and, and those effects um, things you see there is for example lfp that's a uh, lithium iron phosphate so that's that's one type nmc would be nickel nickel manganese cobalt nca would be um, you know a nickel cobalt alumina other things we use, um, you see in the middle there is things like XPS or, um, or ARC. XPS is obviously a, a surface compositional technique, but ARC is accelerated rate calorimetry. Here what we use is we're, we're measuring the total heat released, and then we correlate that to, um, to the performance. So then on the, on, the, on the right there, you see there's a lot of different degradation mechanisms and things that cause failures. So what we're trying to do is relate all those different um, uh, techniques to get things like state of health monitoring, uh, lifetime predictions, and that all really base is um, bases and it depends on the chemistry, you know, the microstructure and how that affects that degradation mechanism. So to kind of give an example of uh, of some results, um, this this work has um, been done and it's been published uh, kind of recently is. We took those cells that, um, again, these are the same ones, the LFP, NCA, and a, and a couple of different compositions, NMC, and tested them under um, just, you know, uh, the base uh, baseline uh, frequency regulation at different uh, states of charge and also um, a peak shaving. So what, what you find is for the LFP cells, they, sorry, I have to move this. Uh, the LFPs have have better, uh, obviously have better aging, and you could tell by looking at it, uh, uh, the capacity um, and, and energy retention. Whereas, when we look at frequency regulation, that degrades the least for all of these, and then also the ones with a higher state of charge uh, degrades the battery the most. So, to get if you if you want to get a little bit more information, um, dive into this a little bit deeper. There's a couple of references down on the bottom that are pretty relatively new that kind of go over these kinds of things. Uh, so it's, um, so some of the things we're going to be doing in the future, it will be continuing this. Uh, we'll be getting additional um, compositions and chemistries from, um, from even more suppliers. I think we'll start to look at also some of the, um, the lithium titanates. These are used more in the, uh, this, most of this is the cathode, but we'll be also looking at the at the anodes for high power applications. And then 
uh, one of the things we'll be moving to in, in the future here is a little bit higher, look, looking at these at a little bit higher temperature and seeing how the temperature affects degradation. So the next section that I'll get into is module testing. And um, as I said before, these are on the scale of about um, 10, uh, the, the maximum is that we're rated for in the laboratory at this point is 10 kilowatt or 40 kilowatt hour. So, and when we look at some of these, again, you'll see there's a lot of infrastructure that was that has been put in. Uh, they're obviously a little bit um, bigger, they're a little bit higher power cyclers. Um, Less channels, obviously per per uh, per cycler, but um, obviously it's a, it's a similar kind of thing. So again, there's about 30 channels that are available. We're always putting in additional um, capacity. Uh, again, we look at pretty much any technology that's that that, that can go out there. We we I think we're um, it's applicable that we could test it. We can put it in hoods and and we can do things like that. Um, and, and you'll see in some of these pictures, uh, some of the, the vanadium flow batteries that are the size of, you know, industrial refrigerators and freezers and things like that. So we we have the uh, the space to put those at this point. And again, the test variables here would be very similar to the single cells, except we, we don't have the, um, the really the capability to measure temperature. Temperature is is pretty much what's ambient in the in the laboratory. So. I'm going to go over just I've, I've chose three different examples of modules <clears throat> to just to kind of go over and, and they're at different stages of um, of how long they've been on test. This first example here is a lead acid battery. It's been on test for about two and a half years, so it's 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 been running for a long time. And I'll try to get get, get into that a little bit, and then I'm going to go go over a, a nickel um, uh, metal halide, and then I'll finish up with a vanadium flow battery, just as examples of the types of things of of, of what we're testing and what we're trying to achieve in, in in the reliability lab. So what you see on the left here is these are um, we have um, these are valve regulated uh, lead acid batteries, and at, at these what what they are is they're about a nominal voltage is about 12 volts. The capacity, you know, 172 amp hours, but these are six cells. Each each module is six cells that connected in series. So we have four of them. So what, what we've done is we've had two, two for um for peak shaving and then two for frequency regulation. And in that um in those slides there, what you could see is underneath it, you can see um, that duty cycle. And the first thing that pops out after a large number of cycles, what you what you see is there is a greater uh, capacity loss for that frequency regulation than it is for, for the peak shaving. So what we do is we we kind of test these performance wise. We test them, you know, uh, frequently when when they're running on this. That maybe you would get a performance test um, every month, a capacity, and then maybe like a an internal resistance maybe every uh, every couple of months. So that, that's kind of the results. And, and like I said before, what we try to do is then say, okay, well, why is this? Why are we losing this capacity? Why is this degrading? So on the next slide, what you'll see is we look at, we look at things like this uh, for the peak shaving duty cycle. Um, you know, it's been running for about two years. Um, some of the degradation mechanisms, and this is in the literature, but it's also with some of our scientists. Um, uh, what 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 they're what they're observing is um, a possible one is you know possible uh, is a positive grid uh, corrosion. So that's lead going to lead oxide, and lead oxide is highly resistive. So it's not um, it's not something you want. Typically, you want it to go to PDO2, where it's 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 more conductive. And another. Um, it, uh, something in, in the valve regulated is, is a electrolyte dry out. Now there are ways to mitigate these. Um, they, they do a lot of things on in the lead acid uh, uh, industry of putting in tin and calcium that uh, that alloys. This has allowed the lead to go to PBO2. And you also, uh, another way to do this is avoid the uh, water, uh, water loss. So that's for kind of the peak shaving cycle one. Um, for the frequency regulation, uh, what, what, we're, what we're thinking here is there's potentially there's shedding. So if you remember that cycle, there's a lot of charge and discharge. There's a, so it's a, every time we charge and discharge these, go through many of these cycles, there's large volume changes. So at the surface, you actually start to shed off lead and lead sulfate off the, off the, off the, uh, off the grid. So just something that, um, that, you know, a, a potential outcome here is maybe frequency regulation that has a lot of these volatile signals. It may not be an ideal duty uh, duty cycle for the for the valve regulated uh, 
uh, lead acid batteries. But again, I'll leave that, um, you see in, in the blue down here is, these are about ready to come off test. They've been running for a long time and they'll be disassembled. And then we can test these by various methods to really understand the degradation mechanism. So again, this one, this one's um, a long, uh, it's probably our, our longest testing one, about two and a half and an approach to three years here in a little bit. And down at the bottom there, you could see if, if you're interested, there's um, a pub, an initial publication on this. And uh, obviously we could follow up a, on a different publication once uh, we understand the degradation mechanisms. So one of the next um, the next uh, modules we tested is the sodium metal halide. In particular, this is a sodium nickel chloride. Um, you see the pictures on, on the left. It is a uh, it's a nominal 48 volts has a capacity of uh, 200 amps. So what what this how this is built inside this um, is there's uh, there's five strings and each string is is roughly 40 amps. But within those five strings, there are 20 cells or tubes that are connected in series. So those um, so in these tubes are are beta alumina, which is a is a ceramic um, and it, at higher temperature, at elevated temperatures. You see that here it's operated at two, 265. You can conduct sodium the sodium ion through uh, through that tube. So. The, it does have a built-in uh, battery management system, so it does um, uh, monitor voltage and current and temperature, uh, and it also calculates state of charge. And you can see this one; it's been on it's been on for about fifteen thousand hours. It cycles once a day, so it's you know six hundred thirty-five cycles. It's it's approaching it's approaching two years here in a little bit. Uh, this was run under peak shaving duty cycles, so you could see that there's a couple different variables. You know, the charge time is twelve hours. But the discharge and uh, time and energy was um, was varied at uh, at a couple different times. Some actually for for, uh, for this module is actually um, in general it showed pretty good uh, energy efficiency, about seventy four percent at the highest uh, discharging energy, and um, and a slow degradation. So at one hundred and fifty days, you know, Taking that out, we, we see about a 0.004% per cycle or 0.9 amp hours per 100 cycles. So again, at this point, this degradation, it's pretty slow and not, not a lot. So it's not known at this at this point, but as we run this for longer and longer times, and then when it comes off, eventually we will go and, and, and analyze these, these kinds of things and compare it to something like a, a, fresh, a fresh tube in there. So, and again, there's a, a reference on the bottom there that um, that's the uh, the early um, some of the some of the early evaluations and things and if if you want to know a little bit more I, I would suggest you uh, look at that reference. So one of the last um, modules that we have tested and again you can you can uh, you can see that this this is a vanadium flow battery from UET. Um, it's been on test for about uh, uh, thirty five hundred hours. It's been cycling uh, two hundred seventy five cycles and. One of one of the um, before it hasn't gone it hasn't gone into a duty cycle yet, but it's been it's been just um, charging and discharging and actually at, at pretty high states of charge for a long time we were doing it at ninety to ten or eighty to twenty, but now we're actually doing it at hundred to to zero state of charge and you can actually see that it's uh, it discharge energy is pretty good the uh, even the energy efficiency is on the order of about eighty two percent so it's it's actually meeting in uh, Meeting uh, what the what the specifications uh, of this of this battery was, and you, and you see down here too. If if you go to some of the higher durations, pretty good, still staying at pretty high energy efficiency. So, and I would say here with the caveat, the little very little, if any, degradation at 275 cycles. So it's 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 running extremely well. So one of the third kind of the um, the third grouping of um, I'll call it as a second life testing. And again, this is, um, I'll describe this a little bit uh, more detail, but the, the picture you see at the top right is of a module. This is from a from King County, which is uh, the Seattle area, King County um, Metro bus. So it's a, a hybrid bus that um, uh, they, they pull it off and that has approximately a hundred single, single cells in it. You can see about 20 of them facing there and there's four rows. So it's 25 and then there's four rows. So it's about a hundred single cells in there. And that's, that's the module that we, we will get and we'll, we'll, we'll receive and we'll, we'll test that. So what I've shown here in this slide is kind of just a, a lithium ion battery, uh, like a, a life cycle. So 
the first, uh, you can see here, uh, the first life, you know, this is used in a car or a bus in our, our in our uh, application here, we're, we're getting it from a bus. It's uh, typically run down to about 80% capacity. So there's this, there's this, a lot of capacity left in these batteries. So what we're what we're gonna what we're gonna do here is is use this as a as a as an energy storage device, right? Where at what capacity can we drive this to? But so we'll be um, we'll be getting these retired mobile packs from King County, and there you can see at the bottom uh, of that slide, the bottom left, that's a, a that's a module that um, comes right out comes right out of right off the bus, and. Off to off to the right there, what you see is what we've uh, installed at PNNL. So these are um, Connex boxes that are air conditioned, but inside them they have module, they have racks that are specifically built where these modules can go in. And then um, I think it's up to 24 at a time. And what we're going to do is 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 re-rate these then. So as we get we get through, is we'd like to re-rate these and use these for stationary applications. And then obviously provide an economic analysis um, and environmental benefits, but also a cost analysis. How much does this cost to really do it? Is it, um, and, and then that that will finish off then the last use is obviously recycling. So we're, we're trying to extend the use of that, of that battery into a, um, from a first use to a second use to, to then recycling. So one of the the last couple of things I'll, I'll kind of talk about a little bit is I, I said before is we're very interested in uh, you know the the degradation so we have a lot of really nice on site things um, on site characterization techniques that we use um, some are in situ the couple on 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 the top there um, the X-ray diffraction and the micro CT where we can look at uh, structural changes you know during operation or 3D imaging uh, we can also you know look at things like ramen where we, we do chemical and structural analysis, XPS for surface, you know, FTIR for uh, functional group analysis, and then um, things like SEM, maybe even a field uh, field emission SEM with chemical analysis on it. So if we look at that for microstructure and, and chemistry and NMR, chemical uh, molecular structures, and then obviously battery testers and cyclers. So um, you know we can we can have these set up that we look at the response to uh, different crew duty cycles and the uh, the DOE OE uh, testing protocol. So just to give you an example, I know some of the the other three we didn't have um, some of those batteries are still running, and we will obviously will do more and more uh, studies analysis on the degradation, but. One that we do have that's um, that's interesting and it's a nice finding is this is a vanadium uh, vanadium redox flow battery that uh, that we had in another program. So this is on a large stack, so it's um, 800 square centimeter stack, um, and it was cycled over eight eight thousand cycles. So um, and what what we did is we we figured out that it was it was some kind of something structurally or something chemically on the surface that was degrading on the carbon electrodes and and how we figured that out is we isolated that so um, what we did is we repeat after eight thousand cycles we replaced the completely replaced the electrolyte and the degradation and that capacity loss was still there so again then we went and, and replaced the the membranes which were nafion membranes that degradation was was still there and it wasn't until we replaced the carbon electrode electrodes were we able able to actually bring all that capacity back so we we, we realized okay it's in it's something in these electrodes that, that's happening so what we did is did a lot of a lot of analysis, right? SEM, X-ray diffraction, SEM for morphological changes, X-ray for any kind of, you know, stacking or, um, you know, the, the lattice parameters, inner layer spacings. Um, so some of the findings were is, is microstructurally, you no, know, that that was nothing was nothing was changed. So after prolonged cycling, it it, it remained the same. It wasn't until we started doing a lot of the surface chemical uh, techniques, Raman and XPS. FTIR that we started to find that there was a lot of surface chemical changes and defects. So maybe cleavage of carbon-carbon bonds and absorption of chlorine atoms. So it was a nice finding. And in, in other words, we were able to, to, to say, okay, what, what was it that's causing this degradation? And we isolated to the surface of the carbon electrodes. And if you'd like to read more about that, there's a, there's a nice um, paper too that was, it was written about this, um, doing this long-term. So something that was interesting that what we did is then we took the that material, um, those those stacks, and we've um, 
we've we've developed and we have a patent on that. And it's it's uh, and the reason we did this is a high performance stack. So this this stack was put together, um, you know, it, at PNNL um, with a lot of um, uh, materials that it was it was run at high current density. So it was, it was achieving very high energy efficiencies. It had an interdigitated design which allows the low um, you know, low pressure drops uh, and it allows us to go to a little bit higher flow rates and things. So that, that helped improve the performance. So those, those designs obviously were, um, um, were patented. And again, that if assuming it, it was over 8,000 cycles, and if you assume you can get a cycle per day, you know, that's somewhere up into 22 years, you know, obviously you might do more than one, but that's just to, just to kind of get a, a little bit of a reference. So what we did with this is we teamed up with, um, with JBill, and if anyone's um, not real familiar, JBill is a uh, global manufacturing company. It does have a, a lot of uh, employees, and it's it's around the world a lot. It, it's it doesn't make a product, but it's in. It does a lot of components that go into into products that you would know. They do a lot of lithium ion work, um, a lot of semiconductor work, things like that. But what they really helped us with and brought to the table here is they can really provide uh, you know manufacturing solutions and also supply chain solutions. So we're in the middle of this process right now, getting closer to the end of phase one is what they did is um, we spent a lot of time with them going over a lot of our plans uh, of how we put these, these stacks together, the materials we use, things like that. And then uh, they're going to they're gonna develop a bill of materials. And then in the second phase, they would take those, those processes and all those um, uh, uh, high volume manufacturing techniques and they would build a stack for us. And then we we would test it. So kind of where we're at now, phase one, um, we uh, you know developing these stack manufacturing costs. So we have developed a bill of materials. Um, we have that from them now, and it's very nice that they they did this for a um, uh, a scalable process and it projected using um, ten thousand. If you would make ten thousand stacks per year. Uh, some of the assumptions are the battery, the battery stack is a, is a 30 cell stack. It's about 800 uh, square centimeter active area. They use their uh, supply chain resources and assume large scale manufacturing. And, you know, there's, there's a couple um, materials in here where they've changed completely from what um, we've used in the past, things like frames. Um, they have things where they can uh, do low cost injection molding. So. What they did is when they when they would come up with a new material or ask a compatibility, they they would send it to, to us at PNNL. We we would test those and uh, you know feed that back to them. But so what what they have is we have a bill of material now for them for that for that for that kind of stack at high volume. So going into the phase two, what we did is we built um, they built a, a a prototype using those techniques of all those large scale manufacturing techniques and those materials that they would use and. They, uh, they've, they've completed that and they're in the process. Of, it's it's in, actually in the process of being shipped to PNNL. So what we'll do at PNNL is we will fill that with, um, you know, various electrolytes and then uh, we will run it for long term like we did before. You know, if we can get to 8,000, 10,000 cycles and then we could do a really nice cost analysis so we can maybe really pull out of this. What is the what is the dollars per kilowatt hours for, for, the, for this type of flow battery? So So that's kind of... Uh, nice, exciting thing. I just thought I would I would tack that on the end, just to, just to show that um, you know there there's other things going on. You know, it's within this to be tested, obviously, in the reliability test lab um, at at long times, but it's um, it's actually coming from from something uh, uh, you know from a bill of materials and from J bill and things. So it's very exciting. So and with that, I think um, I'm about done. So what I'd like to acknowledge and thank is um, obviously Dr. Uh, Imre Zhuk. He's our um, program director, thank him for all his support and funding. And then there's obviously uh, a lot of people behind that do a, a lot of this work on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and uh, just thank uh, all the people at PNNL for all the for all their help. Thank you. All right, thank you, David. I, I wanna encourage you, I've, a lot of you have been putting questions in the chat as we've been going on, but if you do have additional questions, uh, please submit those now. We will start the uh, question and answer period uh, here now. <laughs> so, David, I think we got we had a few questions. Um, 
early on, like when I'm talking about the lithium ion testing and what our temperature capabilities are uh, for that. Do you, I know we've got environmental chambers for the smaller scale stuff. Yeah, I, I would say at this point, it's only for the, the smaller scale stuff we have right at this point. We, we've we actually, when we first started, we could load a module into an environmental chamber if needed. It would just, I would more worry about the housing and things like that than, than the actual cells, but yeah. And then the expectation is as we move to the grid storage launch pad and have more room to yep. extend that, we would have that temperature capability for larger scale. That's system. right. That's right. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, uh, some other questions came through. One of them I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take. It was asking about, do we have on-site capabilities for destructive testing uh, of the, those technologies? And so I, I, um, I can go ahead and handle that or if you want to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could say there, there is, there are some things I think we, we, we approach with caution. You know, some of the things if we're, we're breaking things apart. You know, some of the, the lithium ions, anything that would be, could cause, you know, any kind of issue. Um, I think we're not set up like some of the other labs are to do that. I, I think depending on the technology, yes, we could do that. But um, at this point, we, we really haven't been doing a lot of destructive testing at this point. Okay. Yeah, and I would add to that, I think it's important to realize that our, our focus here is testing within the manufacturer specifications. Absolutely, yep. You're not going above, there's no abuse conditions or anything, but as part of the uh, Office of Electricity Energy Storage Program, our partner lab at Sandia does a lot of that. You know, how do you initiate thermal runaway and those? So there's a lot of close collaboration where they are taking it to the more of the extreme and have those facilities already in place to be able to look at, you know, more destructive and more failure mode uh, instigation. Um, whereas what we're really focused on is what's limiting the, the lifetime when operated under normal conditions and then solving. Okay. One of the questions come up is, uh, you know, how do you work with it? You've got several different battery uh, developers and systems on test, how does someone enter into the, the reliability test lab? What's the best way to start developing that? Sure. So um, obviously we, we are, uh, we, we, um, we have things available. Um, how should I say this? Um, first of all, I think you could contact me. I, I, I'm going to know, and I can put you in, in, into that place of that person, but we have capabilities. Um, I would say most of the channels and things like that are probably accounted for at this point, but we're always adding new ones. And it's good to get someone's um, interest who's interested in that. We're always adding new capabilities. And especially with, as you said, GSL coming on, we'll, we'll always be adding adding capabilities. And we're always interested in looking at new technologies, you know, emerging and also existing technologies, so. Okay. And, and kind of a follow-up question that we received was kind of, you know, what are there additional costs, you know, for like doing the analysis um, in there? Like you showed how you, you went down and looked at saw the lead oxide development under, you know, frequency regulation. Uh, I, I guess I would answer that in, you know, typically our support from the office of electricity supports us, you know, uh, procuring those systems and putting them on test so we have that flexibility to go look at but the overall goal is that that information it will be made public that's correct yeah. and, um, really what changes for us is if someone comes to us and wants that type of analysis but they want to keep that private and that changes the mechanism in terms of how you work with doe but if anyone has those questions or want to that's something we can uh, talk with you and, and try to resolve and see if there's a workable solution to move forward on that. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, we had a few questions on Second Life uh, coming in here. Um, I'm trying to see if I understand it there. But yeah, he says on your first life, uh, your second life graphic, you had kind of the first area is at 100 to 80 percent 
and then 80 to 30 percent is kind of where you see the second life um I, I would put a big question mark there. I, I don't, that's just a, that's just a schematic in a graph graphic. Um, it would be great if you could get to the 30. I, I don't, there, there's, you know, you, you have a little bit of a, um, a variable there that you don't, that, that slope there could be pretty steep at some points. And obviously you don't want to, you don't want to be on that slope. So I think that's just, that was just for, for um, a visual. I don't know where that's at. And I think that's, that's what a lot of our testing is going to look at. So. And in your experience with that project, what have you seen? I mean, just said, for example, if it's a, a 10 kilowatt module originally, then it's obviously down to 80%. But is there a re-rating of the energy capacity whenever you're looking at these for second life? Is there kind of a tighter stringent requirement? So you may yield five kilowatt nominal output system? Yeah, maybe. I, I, and I don't have a good answer for that right now, just because we don't have a lot of uh, feedback and a lot of, uh, a lot of results for that yet. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure on that. So that's, that's how I would kind of leave it. It's kind of, it's hard to tell at this point. Okay. And so that will be, we, we did have a question about the results from the second life. So that that's, uh, TBD. We're yeah, still... that's right. It's, and it's unfortunate. It's, it's been, we've been trying to get and I think everybody else in the, in the country, we've been supply chain issues right now. We're kind of waiting on a couple of things. And then I, I would expect us here to be, be ready to go here at some point in July. Okay. I wonder to offer a follow-up comment on <clears throat> someone uh, chimed in after I spoke about um, um, needing to be public. And so I'll try to do a little clarification here uh, on my comment. You know, if it's something where, you know, you you would like to have a system tested and analyzed, that may be within the DOE purview, but we need to make that data available. If you want to protect IP, there are mechanisms in place to still work with the lab and the capabilities that have been developed on the OE program. We just have to go through a different, different uh, uh, funding right. mechanism, and that would be directly funded coming in. So it's not that any test you do here doesn't have IP protection. It's just, you know, I, I guess, um, the mechanism and the funds in that the the sponsoring organization would provide. So hopefully that adds a little clarity to my comment. <laughs> yeah, and I think and I think if they reach out to us, we can uh, we can put them in the right people here. You know, we have. Um some of our say commercialization managers and things like that that can go over those different mechanisms in, in detail so it like i said we, we we have people who do that all the time so it's 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 not if if, if it, they don't want it released they can they can there's other ways to get around it okay so you, you you've kind of got the systems you outlined earlier we have lead acid batteries the sodium metal halide flow batteries um anything emerging that you're trying to get into the lab yeah, so I, I think uh, one is uh, some nickel zinc. That's that's another one, and um, potentially just uh, you know like a um, zinc based. And a lot of it's yeah. So it it, it if there's a feel there for for some zinc, and I I would like to do a little bit more um, getting into. I think we talked about it before, long duration. So to get in a little bit more long duration testing, I think would be uh, would be a great uh, avenue to get into also. Okay. And then when we look at, you know, what we're able to do now within the laboratory constraints that we have, uh, as you mentioned, 10 kilowatt, 40 kilowatt hours is about what we can do in the lab now. And then uh, obviously, if there's any special hazards that we have to take into account for certain chemistries, we can do those. When we move to GSL, the, how much will that expand? Yeah, that, so it's it's going to jump essentially an order of magnitude. So it would go from 10 to 100 kilowatt or 400 kilowatt hour. So a four hour system, assuming. Um, yeah, so it, it'd be pretty big systems we'll be capable of testing. And so a lot of those systems we're looking at, too, will have the additional thing to be they will be close to being ready to be grid tied and and operation. That's right. That's right. is people are looking for more financing or anything. So Vince, you kind of cut out for me there a little bit. So sorry about that. I was just saying that, you know, 
uh, once we're able to, those are going to be closer to a grid tied system uh, once we get out of GSL. Yep, that's correct. Yep. And then, of course, within the lab system um, or private industry, there, there's a lot of other testing capabilities to move beyond that um, 100 kilowatt, uh, 400 kilowatt limit that we're going to have with GSL. Okay. I did want to take a moment. I know we're, we're, we're still running good on time. So if we've got any other questions coming in, please put those in. Uh, but our DOE program manager, uh, Dr. Imra Zhuk, uh, has been able to join us today for this. I, Imra, I'd hate to put you on the spot, but I didn't know if you wanted to had any comments. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Well, it's not on the spot at all. I've been living on this spot for the last 20 years. Uh, and certainly uh, with uh, PL and also Sandia and Oak Ridge and Argonne. Um, but testing is really a fundamental, of fundamental importance. It's where the chemistry meets the technology and where it finally goes out to industry. Uh, you know, energy storage is becoming more and more central to the whole evolution of the grid. And we get more and more companies with very good products indeed, uh, but we have to be continue, continuously vigilant to make sure that these products do what they're supposed to do, what is promised in the advertisements, and moreover, that uh, companies can find out if there are glitches. So, for example, they can then improve the cycle life or uh, make them more temperature resistant. So this whole business of, the, of testing uh, existing modules is of really great importance. And I'm looking forward to getting that, getting that extended to larger units with the grid storage launch pad, which will, whose work will rest on the work that is being done here and now at PNL. And that's all I want to say. All right. Well, thank you, Emra, and thank you again for your support of this effort uh, over the years. We we truly appreciate it, and. Uh, are looking forward to growing this in, into GSL, so thanks. So we did have a few additional questions come in. David, we got some time. I'll go ahead and uh, ask sure. you that. Um, so there's, well, there, there's a question that came in about how are we, we trying to characterize the second life coming in and what, what, you know, what are we really after? You know, and I think this relates more to you know, evaluating the state state of health and you know that's right i mean it, there, there is there is some things that we're working with king county metro obviously they're, they're going to be doing a little bit of testing before they send it to us so they can tell us a little bit of it so it's not completely cold um right so i mean we'll get a little bit of a state of health you know we'll, we'll know where the capacity and things like that are but and maybe a little bit of history of how it was, how it was run but um in you know i mean that's yeah, that's that. It's it's not going to be you know like a, a fresh a fresh battery. Obviously, it, 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 we'll have a little bit of the history, a little bit of the state of health. That's about it. Okay. So one of the other questions that came in is any kind of correlation between kind of the state of charge, you know, as we hold it long term and do that aging baseline aging test uh, in degradation. I, I know we've done a lot of that work primarily on the individual cells. Yeah. So yeah. obviously, the, the the higher the state of charge, the the faster the degradation was. That that was the big one for the single cells. We haven't done that for the large cells yet. Okay. So the large cells are, I haven't showed any of those, but most yeah, they're mostly you know doing uh, peak shaving and frequency regulation rather than just a just a just an aging. But that's something that we'll we'll obviously we'll do at some point. Okay. And so, but one of the issues we run into that's fairly easy to take a group of individual lithium ion cells and put them on an aging test to kind of get the state of charge, the degradation at state of charge. It's going to be harder for us to do that at a module scale, just in terms of cost. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but, but still, I mean, they do 
for long term, yeah, that's that's I understand. Yeah, what you what you mean? It is. It you would probably rather put that under frequency regulation or peak shaving than than you would just the baseline aging for say, you know, thousands of cycles. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so we may we may need to do some uh, extrapolation from smaller scale tests to look at that that degradation just to get the most out of these these larger scale tests. Yep, I agree. Okay. So question came in about, um, you know, we're, we're, when we're testing for the reliability or does it perform within those specifications, are we looking at the availability? I know people have had concerns like, you know, with plating systems, if you have to repolish the electrode, you know, in a, in a zinc uh, metal anode uh, in there, does that factor into our studies or... How, how does that work whenever? Yeah, we obviously, off? yeah, we won't be doing that. So we're going to run what we receive to what we'll call end of life. Um, we haven't, and it's it's something that I guess we haven't really thought about that. I mean, we would think about, you know, if we would work with someone in industry, if they were interested in that, I, I think, sure, we, we could, we could, we could work with them obviously on that if, you know, we got to a certain level and wanted to ship it back and, and they wanted to replace things and continue to uh, continue to test that. Absolutely. We could, we could do some things like that. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, in essence though, if a, if a technology came in the door and had some kind of operation that was where it was not available to be charged or discharged, we, we would work that into the protocol. Sure. Right. So that's part of their manufacturing specs. And we're not going to violate that or go go against that. That's and right. That's right. Handle that um, necessarily. But yeah, from a standpoint of, you know, the availability of these systems, uh, you would see a disconnect in the data if they're off for any reason like that. But yeah, it, it would not be called out uh, directly or imparted uh, to that. All right. So uh, I think as we've got a few more coming in here, um, are you interested in exploring other probing technologies such as ultrasonic, ultrasound, you know, in trying to determine the state of health? Yeah, we, we've actually, actually have a, um, you know, I would say it's more in our basic research. We, we, we actually have some people looking at that. It just hasn't got to the point where you know, we've, we've probably used that as more on, you know, commercial systems. So obviously I think we'd be open to anything where we can look at, you know, state of health, you know, ultrasonic is, is one of those. I know, I know that we've at PNNL, we've done it, we've done it ourselves. Um, we've had some papers on it. It's just whether or not we can do it on a, a large, large module is that's, that's kind of the question at this point. Okay. I'm trying to look through here and see other questions that have come in. Um, yeah, I think that this is a follow-up to one that I had uh, at one of my comments when I put up there, it says uh, the, the battery will be grid tied in there. And I, I use that term loosely to say, you know, getting to the point where it can be grid tied, you know, and probably, you know, something a hundred kilowatts would be, a, you know, for a behind the meter application or uh, something like there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we would not distinct that, uh, between a new battery and one for second life. You know, as we get to that, we are still looking that, yeah, you, you would need the nest, the other components, even on a second life battery to get it to the point where it can be grid tied. So it's independent of whether it's a second life or new battery system, you still need the balance of system around there to, to get it to that. Sure. Point. Sure. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for their questions uh, uh, that they asked. David, thank you very much for your time uh, explaining what's going on uh, with the reliability test lab and how that's going to play into the uh, new grid storage launch pad. I want to thank our program sponsor, uh, Dr. Imre Zhuk, for joining us again today. Uh, really appreciate the, the support uh, to be here. And so I did want to acknowledge that, you know, we are continuing this. Our goal is every two weeks uh, to have these systems that touch on some aspect of energy storage. 
So July 14th, uh, Sarman and uh, Diane will be talking about energy storage system controls. So how do you actually take all this information we're getting and turn that into a dispatch strategy for these energy storage that doesn't promote additional degradation, you know, um, you know, when you're actually using these in a use case. And then on July 28th, Jamie Holiday will talk to us about uh, utilizing hydrogen as a long duration storage asset. We're seeing a lot of uptick in interest in hydrogen, especially as we start looking at that um, long duration seasonal type application, where we know a lot of cases batteries uh, will self discharge over the course of many months. Uh, so is hydrogen uh, an asset? And there's been some work, you know, trying to look at what the, the benefits are of hydrogen. And Jamie will talk to the, us about that. And so that's the next two. We encourage you to sign up and join us uh, for those uh, meetings. And then uh, we will talk to you on July 14th. So thanks again, everyone, for your time. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Take care. Thank you.